All right, so now that we've made our way through how a muscle actually contracts, we can look at some of these basic physics and physiological type relationships. And the first one I want to talk about is the relationship known as the length tension relationship. And the length tension relationship is going to be related to the length of the sarcomere. So this particular relationship looks at the length of the sarcomere and its ability to generate force. And specifically at the point of stimulation. Okay. So in other words, just to kind of set the experimental stage here, I could take a ring stand, and on that ring stand, I could hang a muscle between two different adjustable arms. And then I could come in and I could give my stimulation, and I could generate a muscle contraction. Uh, and using a force gauge, I can track the amount of force that's generated. Okay, and so I can take that muscle and I can take it from a compressed state all the way over to a very elongated state. Okay, so we'll have our contraction here, uh, our stimulation here to make it contract, and anything in between. And I can look at how much force is being generated as I change the length of the muscle. Does that make sense? Does everybody kind of got an idea what we're, what we're looking at here? And this is basically what we've done in lab, or similar, uh, similar setup here when we were looking at muscle, muscle uh, force uh, in the frog muscle. When we do that, we get a figure that looks somewhat like this. And really, the muscle can be in one of three states. It could be overly contracted at the point of stimulation. Now, we are trying to relate this to the sarcomere length. When the muscle is overly contracted, the thin filaments going to overlap. So if this is my normal sarcomere, when the thin filaments overlap, we're going to look more like that. And what happens is because the thin filaments are overlapping, we have basically portions of the thin filament that can no longer interact very well with the myosin heck. And so when we go through the process of cross bridging, we cross bridge a much smaller portion or fraction of the active active sites to create that contraction. So we reduce the number of that's supposed to be odd, not on of myosin heads we reduce the number of myosin myosin heads we reduce the number of myosin heads I do that on purpose that can bind. We reduce the number of myosin heads that can bind, and this hinders or is a result of the hindrance of cross bridging. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Now, there is a lower limit that we need to identify. When a sarcomere is less than 60% of what we would refer to as its optimal length, force production goes to zero. So we get no force. So you can see that this is not zero here on sarcomere length. This is actually one micrometer. And at over one micrometer, we're actually below that. We're at 60% or below, and no force can be produced. And then as sarcomere length slowly increases, we get a little bit more stimulation that occurs until we get into this area here where we get a maximal amount of force that can be produced. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about this portion of the curve in just a second. Let's talk about this portion here. This is going to be due to the muscle being overly stretched. So the interaction between the thin and the thick filaments in an overly stretched muscle, we end up with too little overlap. So if this is our normal sarcomere, in the stretched sarcomere, we may have very little overlap here, whereas here, we have a much larger amount of overlap. Where here we may have a very small amount of overlap or very or no overlap whatsoever. Okay. So now at that point of stimulation, we have very few myosin heads that can bind on the actin to generate force. Does this make sense? <laughs> So very few myosin heads bind actin uh, active sites, and so we have a low cross bridging that occurs. Now, when the sarcomere is in excess of 175% of that optimal length, this would be our point of no force production. So we can have overly contracted and we can have overly stretched and as we move away from this optimal length force production just simply decreases. Notice that we have a window and it's not just a single point it's actually a window where we have optimal resting length of the sarcomere leading into, uh, into stimulation. And in fact, the sarcomere length in a living individual, a living organism, is going to be maintained at that at that optimal length or within that optimal length range for stimulation. So the sarcomere length is maintained to be optimal at that point of stimulation. And so muscle will try to continue to stay right at this length of sarcomere. Keep the sarcomere at that length so when stimulation actually occurs, we can generate a maximal amount of force. We can generate one gram of force in this particular muscle that we prepped for this experiment. This is called muscle 
tone. You've maybe heard that term before. This is the reason there's kind of an underlying contraction in the muscle. The muscle's not always contracted, but it's not always just completely loose. There's actually still some force that's being generated, and that's the muscle continually trying to force the sarcomeres to stay in that optimal range. So when it is needed and I need a full muscle contraction, all of the sarcomeres are going to be at that optimal length for maximal product force production at any given time. Or at least near maximal force production. Another characteristic of muscle that we can look at is the muscle twitch, twitch principle. When you receive a signal from your nervous system, if that signal is below some certain voltage, so the stimulation is below a certain voltage, so we maybe would call this a small stimuli. The results of that small or below threshold stimulation is to not release enough calcium. Because we don't have enough of those voltage responding calcium channels opening up. So a small stimuli would come in and we'd have just a small number of calcium channels that open up. A little bit of calcium enters into the cell, but it gets picked back up by those constantly on calcium reuptake proteins. And this ends up leading towards no contraction. So there is going to be a certain voltage that's required for muscle contraction to occur. And when that muscle contraction occurs, in theory, there would be multiple levels of muscle force that can be generated by a single myofibril. But in reality and in practice, we're going to find out that when the voltage is high enough and calcium floods into the cell, that stimulated muscle fiber, myofiber, is going to fully contract. It's going to go through a full twitch every single time. So when the voltage is high enough, calcium floods the cell. There will be a minimum voltage that's required for contraction. That minimum voltage is known as the threshold. If we kind of draw this out, and we have our resting membrane potential, and we have an impulse that comes in here. So this is basically your electrical activity, your millivolts here. This would just be time down here on the X. Stimulus comes in. If it's not big enough, doesn't reach this threshold. We don't get enough calcium and nothing apparently really happens. But if it is big enough, then we go through a full muscle contraction. So we have a complete change of voltage. We have enough uh, calcium that floods into the cell. And we create an action potential. Now, if we just reach that threshold or we go above that threshold, it doesn't really matter. Once we reach threshold or go higher, the muscle will twitch. Okay, so here's a figure that's showing a point of stimulation and the muscle tension characteristics. Okay, so this is muscle tension. On the y-axis, you can see that we have that underlying tension from our tone. Stimulation comes in. 
there is a small period or window here where nothing really apparently happens and then we go through our muscle twitch. So in this figure, the arrow is our point of stimulation. That first little window of time, the blue box in this figure, is going to be called the latent period. In that latent period, you can see that there is no apparent change in muscle tension or force production. So we have no contraction that occurs. What's actually happening is we have some internal tension that is being built up here. Anyone know, how many of you have ever gone fishing before and you weigh the fish with one of those spring gauges? You know what I'm talking about? No? So there's a type of scale that basically has a hook on it and then there's a dial. And as you increase tension on the hook, the dial increases, indicating that there's more weight. If you've used those before, you can put it down there and you get a really big fish and hook it on there. I'm not talking about little guppies that you probably all talked before. I'm talking about a big pickerel or sea bass or something. A big, you know, 25 pound fish. You hook that fish up there and it's sitting on the deck of the boat or on the ground, whatever, and you start to lift it up and there's no, no change in that height. And then you get to a point where you start to lift the fish off the ground, the head first starts to come up, and you begin to see that dial change. Even though when you're pulling up, that spring begins to increase in size, and eventually it's going to start to pull on that, um, to pull on that gauge, you have internal tension that's building up. Or consider a rubber band. You can take a rubber band, and if I hold it up, actually, you know what, I'm borrowing your key, but I just saw it. This is a perfect. That's why you brought God works all things together for your good. So you get a practical example. <laughs> so I start to pick this up and I really have very little there's a little bit of little bit of movement right there. But to this point, nothing's really moving, and now it's start you know, start to lift it up. Okay? So I first have to build up that in, internal tension, or I can even do it this way. And we can start to, it's just kind of floppy there, and I start to stretch it out, and then it's building up that tension. And then I can begin to feel that it's pulling back, and that I need more force to get that to spread out. That mm -hmm. It depends. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, that's right. So you have this small window of time where tension has to build up before any sort of force can actually be generated. Okay? And we just simply call that the latent period. It lasts in a muscle typically about two milliseconds. And really what this two milliseconds is, anyone have any idea what that two milliseconds would be? I've already said it several times. Mm -hmm. That two milliseconds is going to be the time that is required or needed for excitation. And excitation, contraction, coupling. Okay, so excitation, excitation, contraction, coupling. And then as we begin to go through that cycle, we got to begin to pull on, you know, it's kind of like pulling the slack out of the rope. You got to pull the slack out of that tug of war rope before you can start to generate some tension. So we also have to have the buildup of that internal tension to take the slack out, so to speak. Not that there's really any slack, but we have to kind of tension, put a little bit of tension on the filaments. Internal. Yeah, internal tension generation. Okay. 
Then we move into this really uh, peaked line here. After the latent period, this is going to be contraction phase. So that's going to be that first triangle on the figure. And this is going to relate to what we refer to as external tension. So this is the muscle actually beginning to go through shorten. The muscle fiber shortens during this period. So the muscle fibers shorten, and as we have the tension generated, the object, whether it's the bone or whatever it may be, the eye being rotated is going to begin to move. Now, the last portion here of the muscle twitch principle, the last part of it, is this second triangle, back down towards that resting muscle tension. And we'll call that the relaxation phase. This is that second triangle. And as that muscle goes through the twitch, increases in tension, and then tension begins to uh, re uh, return back to resting, we're going to have the sarcoplasmic reticulum reabsorbing. So that reabsorbs the calcium that was released during excitation, excitation, compression, coupling, and contraction. And this results in myosin and actin no longer able to associate, so they dissociate. When we don't have calcium in high levels in the cell, we can't allow tropomyosin and troponin are going to move back over the active sites and are going to block the active sites. Now, this muscle twitch principle. Let's say that I took the exact same muscle fiber and I stimulated it with an even larger stimulus. So maybe I draw the arrow and it would be much bigger in place of there with that little blue arrow. How would that change that muscle tension weight? Would it change that muscle tension weight? Any thoughts? Be physiologists. There's no one like sitting in the back. Everybody's just like, oh, I got no one's. No, no one's back there. I'm up here. Look at me. What's going to happen? I would think it would change it. Okay. How many think it would change it? Show of hands. Straw poll. Um, well, How many think? If I increase the size of the stimulus, stimulus mm -hmm. what's going to happen to that curve, the muscle tension curve? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but if you, like, go, you know, maybe not. Okay, okay, real quick. Hands up really high if you think it's going to change. Up really high. <laughs> Okay. I just think about it's not a 50 50 shot. How many think that it would decrease in size? Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. wait. So, <laughs> how many think that there would be no change? Right. <laughs> The principle that regulates muscle tension generation during muscle twitch is known as the all or none principle. As long as we reach threshold, as long as the stimulus is big enough to reach threshold, I could lay the curve, I could lay curve after curve after curve over the curve that already is there, and it would be a perfect mirror image. It would lay right over it. Because it follows an all or none principle. So as long as the stimuli is larger than threshold, 
by the way, if it's not larger than threshold, what's the curve going to look like? Just a flat line. So as long as we are larger than threshold, the switch is going to occur. change the strength of that stimuli, we are not going to change the muscle twitch characteristics. So the muscle twitch does not change. So another way to put this, another way to put this is if we Allow the fiber to twitch or stimulate the fiber to twitch. The fiber twitches at max strength every single time. Now, herein lies a little bit of a conundrum, and it's not really a big conundrum, and you should already have to give that out. But simulate a muscle to contract. I'm telling you that it's going to fully contract, right? Mm -hmm. But not really. What I'm telling you is an individual myofiber. If it's simulated, it's going to contract fully every single time. So it's just a twitch. And it's very fortunate that we actually, on the whole muscle level, can regulate how this. Uh, this force production is going to occur. And it's a good thing that the force that I use when I'm pounding a hammer into a board is not the same force that I use when I'm keeping myself in a board. Good call. Good call. Right. <laughs> so this is an individual muscle fiber or myofiber. Collectively, we may have hundreds of thousands of myofibers in an individual muscle they are going to always go through this full twitch, but we're going to alter how many of them twitch, how frequently they twitch. There's a bunch of other characteristics that we can utilize that will help us to regulate muscle, muscle production. So the force that I use to lift a 20-pound dumbbell is not going to be the same force that I need or use to lift a 50-pound dumbbell. Or in my case, a uh, one <laughs> I don't know why you all laugh at that. They don't even let me in that weight room anymore because the last time I was in there, I took one of those big 45-pound plates and I just got so mad. I just, <laughs> Actually, what I really did is I put it right on my arm and I just went, <laughs> I can fly too. <laughs> you already know that I wear a cape today. <laughs> okay, so muscle tension. Muscle tension production. How can we change? We, we get an individual twitch out of an individual myofiber. How can we change the whole muscle and its tension? And there's a variety of things that we can do. One is we can increase the number of motor units that are recruited. By the way, just to make sure that you really understand what's going on here, what's a motor unit again? It's like all the fibers that are stimulated by one neuron? Yes. So one motor neuron and all of its associated myofibers. If I stimulate that neuron, all of those myofibers in that motor unit twitch. So 
if I want to increase strength, I can increase the number of motor units. I can stimulate 3, 4, 5, 10, 15, 20 individual neural, uh, uh, or, uh, motor neurons in motor units. So increase the number of motor units that are recruited. When we do this, the tension increases that are observed correlate to the number of nerve fibers that fully respond to the stimuli. So one motor unit is going to have a low amount of force. Two motor units is going to have a larger amount of force. Three, even more. Four, even more, so on and so forth. So as I add motor units, I add the ability for that muscle to increase tension. So weightlifting, that 20-pound dumbbell, it may be, you know, for me, like 3% of my motor units. And then I get up to that 50-pound dumbbell, it's like 4% of my motor units. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm breaking the 45-pound uh, weight. It's like 5%. <laughs> An individual fiber... always generates maximal tension for each fiber. So collectively, I can... So individual fiber, one fiber is one maximal tension for that fiber. Two fibers is going to add together both of their maximal tensions. So I'm going to sum things together here. So we can get summation of two or more fibers resulting in increases in contraction. And really contraction strength. So to lift that 50 pound dumbbell, I have to have summation of additional muscle fibers going through their full muscle twitch, their full muscle contraction. All right. I really wish that we can continue, could continue uh, another really semester on skeletal muscle, but we have to kind of wrap things up and we need to move on. We're just kind of giving a summary of all of these systems. The last thing that we need to do here is we need to talk about that ATP supply. We already know that ATP is going to be used all over muscle contraction. We're going to use it to create the cross bridge. We're going to use it when we're pumping calcium back out of the cell against its concentration gradient. We're going to use ATP to maintain all of these different proteins and everything. So we have a high, uh, high energy demand. In fact, energy demand or ATP demand in the muscle makes muscle or uh, allows muscle to be called uh, the metabolically active tissue in the human body. It requires a lot of energy, a lot of biochemistry. Now, muscle energetics, and hopefully you've experienced this before in chemistry and in previous biology classes, and so hopefully a lot of this isn't new, but we're going to primarily be getting our energy from glucose, and we're going to get ATP from glycolysis. We're going to get ATP produced through the citric acid or the, the Krebs cycle, and we're going to produce these electron-carrying shuttles that will go into the electron transport chain to give us large amounts of ATP. Please tell me you've experienced this before. I know some of you have. Okay. So you've talked a little bit about the provisional cycles for energy supply. This is just one particular example of where we can get energy from. And really, there's two here because we can get energy just from glycolysis or if we 
Couple that with the stuff going on inside of the mitochondria, we can get more. But there's also one more source of uh, ATP production. So I'm not going to go through the 10 steps of glycolysis, the eight steps of the citric acid uh, cycle, and I'm not going to go through the energetics of the electron transport chain with electronegativities and oxygen is the final electron acceptor and all that kind of stuff. You should already know that. We're just going to basically briefly survey three levels of energy supply. And the three levels of energy need. And when I say levels of energy need, I'm talking about when is energy going to be required. And we can have energy that's required immediately. So if I begin to walk, I need energy immediately available. If I continue to walk, it's going to become a little bit more prolonged. And if I start to walk all the way home, which is like 15 miles, I'm going to need it for like five hours. Gosh, now I'm like, is that gal's been playing joke on me? Sucker! <laughs> <laughs> I just call one of you up. But like, come and pick me up. I need a ride home. <laughs> you wanna not F in my class? <laughs> then you better get moving. long-term need, the intermediate, intermediate, I'm saying intermediate, immediate, the immediate need is going to be two, is going to come from two enzyme systems, not included on this figure. So we're going to have two enzyme systems that are going to generate ATP for us. And really both of these enzyme systems are going to be enzymatic systems that transfer, help to facilitate the transfer help to facilitate the transfer of inorganic phosphate from a source molecule to ADP, which will help us to generate ATP. Okay, so, and the, uh, the chemical equation here, in brief terms, will be ADP plus inorganic phosphate to generate ATP. Now, this could come from a source. Doesn't necessarily have to just be inorganic phosphate. It could come from another molecule that acts as a source for inorganic phosphate. So two, two enzyme systems. One is creatine kinase. Now what do we know about this molecule? Okay, we know nothing about this molecule. That's great. Now what do we know? You guys know some stuff already about this molecule. Creatine kinase. What kind of molecule is it? Enzyme. What does this particular enzyme do? Creation. Well, I'm okay. I'm so sorry. Holy cow. No. What kind of morbid? Are we going to like burn it and then bury it in the ground? <laughs> Scatter reactions? <laughs> are we gonna are we gonna burn it and scatter this enzyme's ashes? 
What are you talking about? Creatine. Creatine <laughs> kinase. <laughs> not cremation <laughs> kinase. <laughs> <laughs> is this someone with <laughs> What does a kinase do? Let's start there. Okay, it's an enzyme that does what? <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously it scatters something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so a kinase adds a phosphate to something. What are we going to add a phosphate to? <laughs> okay, we're going to add the phosphate to ADP. And where are we going to get that phosphate from? So that creatine has something to do with it. Right? Okay, that creatine has yeah. something to do with it. <laughs> Not from the ashes. <laughs> from the ashes we will arise. <laughs> as creatine phosphates. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so creatine refers to creatine phosphate. You're going to generate creatine because we're going to remove that phosphate from creatine phosphate, which I'm going to just abbreviate as CP, not C3, or C3PO, CP, and ADP. So this is our source for the inorganic phosphate. We're going to add it to the ADP, and we're going to get ATP. The creatine phosphate is our source. This is our source, creatine phosphate. Okay. How many of you have ever heard of creatine powder? You go over to GNC and you're like, hey, I'll take some creatine. I'm going to get a little bit bulky. You've never heard of creatine powder? You guys have. It's the big old bottles of stuff. Yeah. It's the big old bottles. A creatine. If you go over here tonight, you probably see a bottle of it sitting on the floor because the jugheads in there are thinking they're looking stronger because they're taking creatine phosphate. Um. And all they're doing is making expensive urine. <laughs> but the idea is that it's going to play off of this creatine phosphate system, this phosphagen system. You should have told them that. I've told them. It doesn't do anything. One of the things that we know that it does is it helps the muscle retain water, and that will make the muscle look bigger, but if you really think about it, we want to have water moving out of the muscle, because when water, when water moves out of the muscle, it's bringing all those metabolic toxins that are built up. Yeah, so creatine phosphate protein powders, Mule replacement, those are all just expensive urine producing substances. So creatine phosphate, creatine phosphate plus ADP gives us an ATP. This is called the phosphagen system. And this is a really, really quick, dirty way to get ATP, and you can get it almost immediately. Oh, also, I guess I should mention this. I guess I didn't really mention this. You have a small amount of ATP that always exists, it's always there, but this amount of ATP here, you're going to deplete it with that initial muscle contraction really quickly, and so you want to replenish it, and so we're going to replenish it initially by using primarily creatine phosphate and ADP to generate our ATP molecules to the phosphagen system. This system is going to help allow this system to get up and running at a higher efficiency. Our other enzyme system is going to be myokinase. This is very specific to muscle. We're going to find that myokinase is going to take two ADP molecules. One of them will act as a source for the inorganic phosphate. The other will act as the ADP. And we end up with an AMP plus an ATP. So these are immediate. This is five seconds after muscle contraction begins. You're probably going to deplete these systems. So this is just to basically get you through that very initial 
muscle contraction. Maybe you're walking across Highway 115 tonight and you almost get hit by a bus. And the first five seconds to run away comes from these two enzyme systems. But they get depleted really quickly. We run out of our supplies and our enzymes get worn out relatively quick. And then we shift to more of a short-term need. And that short-term need, what happens with the onset of exercise? What are some things that happen? Yeah, when you start to exercise. Ooh. Ooh. Just pull that off the wall here. <laughs> <laughs> Want to see me fold a smart board? <laughs> 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 Probably three percent for a smart board. What happens when you start to exercise? Do you start to breathe immediately? Heavier? Do you have heavy breathing immediately? Okay, you don't have it immediately. Heart rate? Does it accelerate immediately? Okay, that's gradual as well. What about muscle contraction? No, I think it's. Well, it's immediate. Yeah, it is. Force production is immediate. Yeah. Okay? For the first five seconds, you can s sustain that immediate high level of muscle contraction by our two enzyme systems, but those are going to deplete. In the short term, you still have full muscle contraction occurring if you're sprinting away from, let's say, a skunk on campus. I've seen them. Yep. But breathing rate and heart rate haven't accelerated enough. And so we don't have oxygen nor nutrient supply into the muscle to support the level of muscle contraction that's occurring. But we still need to supply energy to that, to the muscle, right? We need to still provide ATP to the muscle so that it can continue to, to contract at its optimal rate. So during a short amount of time, about two minutes, three minutes maybe in length, we're going to receive energy from what's known as anaerobic fermentation. So anaerobic fermentation. Anaerobic because we don't have oxygen. There's no oxygen that's available. This should be an A there, anaerobic. No oxygen available, so we can't send pyruvic acid into the citric acid cycle and into the electron transport chain. At the end of the electron transport chain, we need to have oxygen present there. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. If oxygen's not there, everything gets backed up to basically the point of pyruvic acid. So the fate of pyruvic acid can go either into acetyl-CoA, citric acid, and electron transport, or it can be shifted into a molecule called lactic acid. When we shift it into a lactic acid, we no longer need that oxygen. We are diverting the chemical pathway to a different pathway. It's kind of like shifting the conveyor belt, so to speak. When we do that, we actually can generate a small amount of ATP. It's a pretty low amount of ATP, and if we continue to have high level of muscle contraction for a full long period of time, we're going to begin to lose our ability to continue to efficiently contract the muscle. So we're going to use anaerobic fermentation because it doesn't allow or it doesn't require oxygen. This is going to allow your rate of respiration to accelerate enough that now we can deliver an adequate amount of oxygen into the muscle tissue. So at the end of glycolysis there, we form pyruvate or pyruvic acid. And when oxygen is not present, we shift the pyruvate into lactate or lactic acid. Now, when we shift pyruvate into lactate, that allows pyruvate to be pulled away from glycolysis. We no longer have pyruvate building up at the end of glycolysis. And so the whole glycolytic pathway, those 10 chemical reactions can continue to occur. It's kind of like uh, you go to the grocery store, and when you start to have groceries pile up right up by the cashier, what happens to the belt? It stops. As soon as you remove those groceries, the belt starts again. Okay, so we're trying to keep the belt going. So we shift pyruvate towards lactate. 
And what happens here in glycolysis is you can see that we have this thing called NADH. NADH is basically just the carrier of electrons. When we take pyruvate into lactate, that NADH, which is required, those NA, NAD plus, NAD plus is going to be an acceptor of electrons. This molecule is needed for glycolysis to continue. So that NADH that forms when electrons get strapped onto NAD, if we don't have any available NAD, NAD plus, glycolysis would stop. So NADH needs to be shifted back to NAD plus so that those NAD pluses can go back in except their electrons and electron transport, or I'm sorry, the glycolytic pathway can continue. Whoa. The type of so NADH gets converted into NAD plus, and this allows us to continue this process called substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation means that we get this direct synthesis of two ATP every time we go from glucose to pyruvate. Pyruvate gets shifted to lactate, and in that process, pyruvate to lactate, the difference between pyruvate and lactate is we have additional electrons that get added to the pyruvate to form lactate. Okay, so. I got this molecule here, NADH. Just think of that as being electrons. Mm -hmm. I want to get rid of those electrons so I can reform NAD plus. So more electrons can be accepted out of the middle of the glycolytic pathway, and glucose can be converted into pyruvic, pyruvic acid, and we can continue to get two ATP. So I need some place to, to drop these electrons off at. Mm -hmm. Normally, they get dropped off at the electron transport chain, but without oxygen, this whole system backs up. I need oxygen to get the groceries off of the conveyor belt, so to speak. NADH now goes to pyruvic acid, and through an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase, those two electrons get added into the pyruvic acid to form lactate. Now I've reformed NADH, or NAD+, plus rather, can go back up here and allow that glycolytic pathway to continue. So all that glycolysis, all that Inside of the cytoplasm, inside the cytosol, mm -hmm. glucose through 10 steps, it goes glucose, mm -hmm. glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, fructose 1,6-5-phosphate, and we continue along with these chemical reactions all the way down until we get down to phosphoenol pyruvate and then pyruvate. And we're modifying the, the chemical bonds in each of those, each of those uh, substrates as we move down the glycolytic pathway. The difference between pyruvate and lactate is the addition of an electron. I add an electron to pyruvate, that is the chemical reaction that creates lactate. Pyruvate is no longer present because it's now been converted into lactate. The source for the electrons is the NADH that was generated in the middle of the glycolytic pathway. One of the steps in glycolysis is to strip off some electrons from one of our substrates. Those electrons get transferred down here to pyruvate to lactate, and that is anaerobic fermentation. It allows the production of lactate, and in the process we regenerate NAD+, and then we can continue glycolysis because we've removed our pyruvate, so everything tends back towards pyruvate, and we can generate ATP. What I'm going to recommend for you to understand this is go back into your chemistry book or into your... Um, into another biology book. The biology book is up there. I'm going to pick the SMBI 101. Go and take a look to the library or Google it and take a look at the chemical reaction. And you'll see immediately what I'm talking about. You get it. Because he's seen this a lot before. You just got done with that in biochemistry. Okay, great. Just got done with it in biochemistry. It's about all that biochemistry is good for. Just kidding.
Okay, so we get the substrate level phosphorylation, which is just a reference to the production of ATP. Now, this is going to last two or three minutes. There's only so long that we can continue to convert pyruvate into lactate. Eventually, lactic acid is going to build up high enough in the cell that it becomes problematic. So if we need to continue to run, maybe that skunk is continuing to chase after us on campus and been chased them off now for like three minutes. We're going to have to have a new source can they go that fast? of ATP. Skunks? Yeah. Skunks can run 45 miles an hour. Oh my I'm just kidding. Oh my <laughs> <laughs> and they can jump they can jump a three-story building with one bound. <laughs> They're probably gonna come right through this window sometime. <laughs> I don't see the like Yeah, they're usually running away or they're stopping and they're like <laughs> I don't know why you would chase the skunk though. Like, are you retarded? They're kind of freaky at night. You don't really know what they are because they kind of waddle. Yes, they're so scary. <laughs> it's waddling! I didn't know what it was, so I was like, I was like, maybe it was a groundhog that I saw. All right, so long term, we're going to need to use glucose, or we can also use fatty acids. Those fatty acids have to be uh, pre processed. But really, what this comes down to is these are organic molecules. They're basically going to be carbon sources. And the long term system is going to be aerobic respiration, which is collectively going to be glycolysis, which in itself is actually anaerobic, but when we couple it to Krebs cycle and to the electron transport chain, the ETC, in the presence of oxygen, the whole thing is going to be referred to as aerobic respiration. But oxygen is required because right here at the very end of the electron transport chain, we're transporting electrons through these proteins and they're being picked up by oxygen to be converted into water. As long as oxygen is there, those electrons have a place to go and all of the chemical reactions can continue. The provision here is going to be between 36 and 38 total ATP that can be produced from a single molecule of glucose. Whereas with glycolysis, uh, just glycolysis alone as an anaerobic fermentation event, it's just two ATP from a single molecule of glucose. So this is a lot bigger payoff, 36 to 38 ATP from the same uh, amount of carbon wrapped up in a glucose molecule. Now, in all reality, all three of these systems, whether it's the short-term system, the immediate system, or the long-term system, they actually are occurring all at the same time. But they are occurring at different percentages. So at the immediate onset of exercise, creatine phosphate is like 90% of ATP production. And lactic acid is like about 8%, and then glycolysis, or uh, uh, aerobic respiration is like 2%. Okay? Now as you get closer and closer to 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes of exercise, we shift from a much smaller percentage of ATP being produced during, uh, from the immediate source, less from the short term and most coming from the long term from aerobic respiration. There's one final thing to note here. There is this thing called the crossover effect. And for most people, this occurs right around about 30 minutes after the onset of exercise. And within that 30 minute time period, the glucose that you store in the liver and in the skeletal muscle is going to decrease or it's going to deplete. So we're going to shop out our glucose stores. And so we're going to need additional carbon source, an additional carbon source. And so we're going to shift over from glucose being the main provider of carbon to now fatty acids being the main provider of carbon. 
So this becomes our main organic molecule that's going to be used. At the, um, prior to glycolysis, fatty acids cannot go directly into glycolysis. We have to go through uh, this thing called, this biochemical process called beta oxidation. And what happens with beta oxidation is it actually yields acetyl-CoA. So we're not, from the fatty acid, we're not coming in at the beginning. We're actually coming into the mitochondria. We're just producing uh, molecules of acetyl-CoA from the fatty acid. And basically, the number of carbons that we have in the fatty acid, so maybe it's an 18 carbon, a rough rule is to take 18 divided by 2, and that'll give you an idea um, how many acetyl-CoA uh, acetyl -CoA molecules can be generated, so about 9. And then you'll go through citric acid to get two AT3 from there, and then you'll get 34 for each acetyl-CoA molecule. Actually, divide that in half, I'm sorry. From two acetyl-CoA, so if it's nine, you'd get four and a half of the two and the 34. Four and a half times as much ATP. Does that make sense? I'm kind of dri dribbling now. Think about skunks jumping through the window. That'd be scary. It'd be like a horror film. <laughs> so I've already sort of mentioned this, but just want you to have record of this in your notes. These three energy systems occur simultaneously. And as they occur simultaneously, we'll have a percentage of our ATP production from each system. Changes during prolonged work. <laughs> <laughs> 